Greetings, everyone. It is my hope that the Lord will multiply his grace and his peace to all of you. Welcome to Bible study. And we want to welcome those who are participating via Facebook Live. Did I say it right? Facebook. All right. I'm trying. I'm trying to get it right. Um, so next week, Wednesday, will be our final Bible study for the Thursday, sorry, Thursday. We'll take a little break for the holidays and give you a chance to do your shopping it is. All right. Sister Stacy said shopping. So next week will be our, our final Bible study for the year. And we'll pick up um, sometime in January. We're, as you know, looking at the doctrines of grace. And for the last little while we have been looking at the security of the Christian we'll continue this evening we have been examining the doctrine of the security of the Christian's position in Jesus Christ now this doctrine teaches that it is God by his own power through the Holy Spirit that indwells us. He keeps us. He preserves us. Amen. Those who have been saved, he keeps us and he preserves us and he will do so until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. And um, this is not something that we speculate about. In our first lesson, we, we read from Philippians 1 verse 6, where Paul says that he was confident that the one who had begun a good work in them would perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. We are persuaded by the weight of scriptural evidence that the position of individuals who have been saved by the grace of God is very secure. Their salvation and their secure position is based upon Christ's perfect and finished work on the cross of Calvary. It's not based upon anything they have done or anything that they can do. It is the faithfulness of Jesus Christ, not our faithfulness that guarantees the security, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. I, I might say that um, we will shortly be considering some passages of scripture which seem to indicate that um, our position is not as secure as I have been saying. We're not shying away from those brethren. We're going to confront it and just deal with them so that you can know that it is not as you have, you might have heard. In, our, in lesson 29, we commenced a detailed study of Romans 8, 28 to 39. And we said at the, the time when we started that there is perhaps no other passage of scripture that um, 
speak so forcefully to our security being bound up or connected with the sovereignty of God. The fact that his purposes do not change and that his goodness is constant. He doesn't waver, he does not change. We have been looking at it and we're going to try and finish. It's a pretty long lesson, but I'm not going to hurry either. I'm not going to hurry, so don't get nervous. Wherever we are at 10 o'clock, I'll stop. <laughs> but um, if, we, if we don't finish it up this evening, Lord willing, next week. In verse 28, we, we're going to try and finish, but just, I, I just want to do a little revision um, because this, the, these things, brethren, are very important to me. They are important to me because I don't believe that we can really express ourselves as Christians in the way that God wants us to if we are not confident that we are in a secure place. If you have no assurance of salvation, you can never really be comfortable as a Christian. If you're always looking behind your back, you can't be comfortable. I know that in the heat of the moment when we are in our worship services, everything is fine and dandy. But as soon as we are out, the doubts come back and the fears come back and, and, and we need to settle it. So it's, it's, this is very important to me. So we're going to do a little revision. In verse 28, Paul writes, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the call according to his purpose. Very remarkable verse. Paul, in this verse, is giving us an absolute guarantee that those who love God, and they love God because they have been called according to his purpose. They don't just love God because they have a heart to love God. If God had not called them and loved them first, they could never love God. Okay? But for those persons... Every single thing that happens to them, every detail of their lives, God weaves it together to fit into his perfect plan for their lives. Everything, 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 everything. And sometimes when we are going through, we forget or, or we, it might be difficult for us to appreciate when, when your marriage is in difficulties, when you have lost a loved one, when you are coming under pressure on your job at work, um, these circumstances, when um, there is sickness in the body and we are in pain, we begin to wonder if this could be working together for my good. Is it true or is it not true? It's true. And even though we mentally might be able to quote the scripture, you know, um, you know we still have difficulty believing. So we want to go over the ground again and say, we, we have to be able to, 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 to understand that. And, and brethren, even our chastening, and we're going to look at that before we finish this matter of security. We're going to look at the fact that we're going to ask the question, when does God punish us with a penal punishment or does he chasten us with fatherly concern? Is he being unkind or is he just chastening us like a good father does? 
all things work together for good. All things. All things work together for good. Now, now what does Paul base this guarantee on? How, how can he be so sure that all things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose? He explains that in verses 29 and 30. He, he didn't just make that statement and say, believe it because I said it. He says, I'm going to tell you why you can trust it. And he tells us that we have assurance, <clears throat> and he uses five words. He, he says, we can know that all things work together for good because God foreknew us, because God predestinated us, because he called us, because he justified us, he glorified us. Whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. We have tried to stress the point that all the way through, the important link in the chain is provided by the word he it is God all the way there is at no point does he relinquish control that's why we know that we are secure at no point does he say um, I foreknew you I predestinated you so I'm going to allow the preacher to call you I'm going to send an angel. He says, I'm doing it by myself. And, and he, he, in verse 28, I want to call your attention to this. In verse 28, he, he refers to, to the fact that all things work together for good to them who love God and them who are the called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? What is his purpose? He explains to us what the purpose is in verse 29 and 30. And he uses these five words to tell us what he means when he says according to his purpose. Somebody might ask, what purpose does God have for me? Purpose is a plan of sovereign grace which is so comprehensive that it entitles every saved person to trace his or her salvation back to an eternal decision by God. I am here and I am saved because God purposed that it should be so. He foreknew me. He predestinated me. This is no accident. I am here today as the result of a plan. A plan by Almighty God that was conceived in eternity. The God, and, and this plan is going to carry me all the way to glory. And I, I not only can look back, but I can look forward to that glory as a guaranteed certainty. He, has, he, he didn't just say I was foreknown and predestinated. He said, uh, he, he said that I am also, I was justified and I'll be glorified. And, and, and in between my what happened in eternity and what is happening in time is that calling when, when he summoned me with a divine summons and there was I had to respond so this plan is a plan that goes all the way to the very end to glorification 
when I am perfected. So when we talk about the fact that we are secure, it's not because we feel secure in and of ourselves. It is because of what God has guaranteed. We, we serve a sovereign God and none of his purposes will be thwarted. Amen. These two verses, verses 29 and 30, uh, highlight a sequence which is known as the golden chain of salvation. It highlights the order in which God saves his people. And it also indicates, as we have said, that from start to finish, salvation is a work of the Lord. From start to finish, from start to finish, those whom he foreknew, he predestinated. Those whom he predestinated, them he also call it it's him all the way as a work of god from start to finish Amen. you see brethren if 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 our salvation was left up to what we did i based on what i know of human beings i wouldn't have any confidence that any of us would be saved if it were left left up to what we do just by how stupid, foolish, and sinful we are, I wouldn't hold out no hope that any of you would be saved. I'm sorry. You look nice and I love you, but you're not that good enough. You would make shipwreck of everything that God was trying to do. And, 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 and brethren, you see the what we are teaching, even people who don't believe it see the evidence of it in their life, you know. They know that if God left it up to them, they would make shipwreck. We learn from these two verses that God in the sequence of salvation first brought us under what we call the sovereignty of his wisdom. He foreknew us. He foreknew us. And before he chose us in Christ, he knew everything about us. And yet he still loved us and chose us. That should give us a great deal of hope. Because before he chose you, he, see, he saw all your mess. Before he chose you, he, he saw it. Wrong choices, bad decisions. You know, he saw it, but he still chose you. So if we had the ability like God to see things before they happen, to know what would happen, if we had that ability, and we could see into person's lives. We wouldn't choose some of them. Because we'd say, no, sir, that one, that one going to mess up. But you see, brethren, the truth of the matter is, there is not anybody in this room or anywhere else in the world who is saved that God could, could look down the line and see that they would have come out to any good without him. There's, there's nobody who could have had any kind of good record if it hadn't been for the grace of God alone. Amen. We must stop fooling ourselves. You weren't good enough for God to save. You weren't acceptable for God to save you. I don't care if you were born, if you are a fifth generation apostolic. You, your apostolic legacy couldn't qualify you to be saved. Then he brought us under the sovereignty of his will. He predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus Christ. And he did so before the foundation of the world. 
So before we were born, he put limits and boundaries upon us. And he said, the limits and boundaries that I'm going to put on you is that I have reserved you to be conformed to the image of my son. Amen. That is my purpose for you. You are going to look like my son. And let me listen now, brethren. I, I, years ago, I did not understand this. I used to say, you know, we, God has predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. And I, I did not understand what predestination really means. So I, I understood this wrong. God determined when he predestinated us that we're going to look like Jesus. Predestination is always unto something. You do have predestination in a vacuum. God said, in, let me speak Jamaicanese and hope that those on live stream will understand. What God said is, a solid thing said, you are gonna look like Jesus. That is what is going to happen. You are predestined to look like Jesus. I am going to make it happen. That's what he's saying. I am by my power, I am going to make it happen. So I thought, you know, that, you know, God, that was God's intention, but it's, it, it's left up to me now to make it a reality. This is what he wants. But John now has to deal with it. And poor John was trying. And the more poor John tried, is the more him never looked like Jesus. I don't, I'm not going to respond to what you all say. I'm, I'm bigger than that. Some years ago, anybody here was alive when Sir Clifford Campbell was the Governor General of Jamaica? You were alive in that time. It wasn't so long ago, you know. He was... He was giving a speech at the Carib Cinema many years ago. And so he was, he was walking to the stage and there was just one spotlight that was shined on him as he made his way to the stage. And everybody in the Carib Cinema was so quiet. And when he went up, Somebody said, look how we ugly governor general. <laughs> when he went to the mic, he said, the governor general is in a unique position. I guess what he meant by that was, if I wasn't the governor general, I'd tell you, oh, ugly today. <laughs> So, so to that little crew over there, I want to say the pastor is in a unique <laughs> position. <laughs> Thirdly, he brought us under the sovereignty of his command. He called us. He called us. He summoned us with a divine summons and made us willing to obey the summons. Fourthly, he brought us under the sovereignty of his righteousness. He justified us. 
he rendered a verdict of not guilty over us and declared us to be righteous in his sight. He imputed to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. If we could only, if we can understand that, oh my, he imputed to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ, giving us a standing before himself, which is so flawless, so spotless, so pure, so pristine, that no power in the heavens, no power on earth, no power in hell can bring any accusation against us that has the potential to condemn us. It's not possible. It is not possible. And finally, he brought us under the sovereignty of his glory. He glorified us. In actual terms, as far as we human beings are concerned, how we see it, uh, glorification has really not happened yet. Glorification will come, we will be glorified actually when the Lord comes back and he so constitutes us that we will not be capable of sinning anymore. It won't be possible for us to sin anymore. He's going to take us, not, he's going to deliver us from the penalty of sin, which has already happened. He's going to deliver us from the power of sin, which is happening through the process of sanctification. Through the process of justification, he has delivered us from the penalty of sin. That's not, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Through the process of sanctification, he is delivering us from the power of sin. And when we are glorified, he'll deliver us from the very presence of sin. So that's a future event. But as far as God is concerned, it has already happened. Amen. So, 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 if, 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 if in God's mind it has already happened, why should I doubt that it's going to happen for me? I'm not the one who is charged with the responsibility to glorify myself. God is going to make it happen. So Paul says, we are glorified. We are already glorified. So we don't have to wait until we die or until Jesus returns to know if we will ultimately be saved. In the eternal plan of God, we are already glorified. But some persons now might ask, what about all the years between my initial conversion uh, and my death or the coming of the Lord. What, 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 what will happen in that time? Is, is there a possibility that during those years of testing and trial, something may go wrong and I may lose my salvation and be deprived of eternal life? The answer is an emphatic, No! I have to say it like that. I don't mean to scare you. And you know the type of person that you're dealing with, so you should have known that was coming anyway. No. 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 A lot of things can happen. A lot of terrible things can happen. We can do a lot of crazy stuff. But... Being deprived of eternal life? No. We are not only predestined for glory. We are also preserved for glory. Anything God predestinates, he preserves. Because he cannot be made a liar. 
if he says I have predestinated you to be conformed to the image of my son then I have to preserve you so that it happens And so, in the closing verses of this extraordinary chapter, which will be verses 31 to 39, Paul draws his entire argument in respect of the Christian security to a, a great triumphal conclusion. And he does so in a series of challenges to every influence that might oppose our confident assurance of God's ability to bring to a satisfactory completion the work that he has begun in our lives. And so Paul, Paul brings some scenarios to challenge us and, and, he, and he says, let's see if these can, can eradicate our security in Jesus. He explores every possible point of departure from the salvation which is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. He, he explores it. He, he, he goes down every road, possible road, to see, will this road take me to a place where I lose my security? And he finds that every point is blocked and guarded by the amazing grace of God. That's why we say we are not only saved, we are safe. Not only saved, but safe. And we are saying this, brethren, understanding that the charge will come, that if we teach like this, we are saying to people, you can live any way you want to live. But we are saying to them, persons who are saved don't live any way they want to live because built into the gospel is the power of God which convicts them when they do wrong but before he, 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 he runs down these avenues before he explores these points Paul makes a statement which indicates very clearly that he already knows what the answer is. In verses 31 to 32, he says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things all things in our brethren freely 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 all things the message translates the passage like this so what do you think with god on our side like this how can we lose if god didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us embracing our condition and exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son. Is there anything else he wouldn't gladly and freely do for us? Let's consider the Passion Translation. So what does all this mean? If God has determined to stand with us, tell me who then could ever stand against us. For God has proved his love by giving us his greatest treasure, the gift of his son. And since God freely offered him up as a sacrifice for us all, he certainly won't withhold from us anything else. He has to give. Brethren, this is the word of the Lord. If you were good nominal Christians, you would have said, thanks be to God. <laughs> what, what is Paul arguing in these verses? 
he's, he, he's saying the saints will certainly face oppositions. They will face testings, trials, sufferings, disappointments, and even failures. I might even go as far as to say backsliding. See, brethren, we are not afraid to confront the extremities because our God is extreme. Even though we will go through these things, none of them has the potential to destabilize our position in Christ. Again, remember you're talking about a God who foreknew us and predestinated us. Why? Because God is for us. Since God is for us, our spiritual survival is assured. God is for me. God is for me. He's not against me. He's for me. The words for us. Listen now. The words when Paul says, if God is for us, if God be for us, the word for us express the eternal commitment of Almighty God who loves us with an everlasting love. If God be for us, Paul is saying the Almighty God in all his omnipotence is for us. And because he does not change, he will never be on for us. He is for us. He is for us. In the midst of my wandering and going astray, he is for me. Part of our problem, brethren, is that it sounds better than we deserve. And our carnality and our humanistic tendencies tell us we don't deserve this. And it's true, we don't. And if you don't, if you don't, it, whenever you are dealing with the Bible, you have to start with God. You don't start with yourself and argue your way to God. You start with God and argue your way to yourself. How do we know that he loves us? He demonstrated the love by sacrificing his only begotten son for us. That's how we know that he loves us. Jesus Christ is the best gift that God has to offer. And when God gives us Jesus Christ, he gives us everything that comes with Jesus Christ. So, so really, you know, brethren, grace and peace and joy and all these things, these things are not entities in themselves, you know. They come with Jesus Christ. They are part of the Jesus Christ package. That's why when you and I claim that we have Jesus, there should be a difference in the way that we live. Paul is arguing from the lesser to the greater. If when we were sinners, God gave us his best, now that we are his children, will he not give us all that we need? Jesus himself used the same argument when he tried to convince people that it was foolish to worry or fear. He says, God cares for birds and sheep and even for the lilies. And he tells us, you are more valuable to me than all of these things. And I care for them. Not one bird falls to the ground without my knowledge. Have you read what he said to Job? He said, Job, when the lions are hungry, is you the cry to? Who do you think satisfy them? Who do you think satisfied them? 
God freely gives all things to his own. All things. He gives freely. There, there's no hesitancy in God. God is never feeling pressured. God, he said, I have given you Jesus. Everything comes with the package. So since God is for us, and since we have received the best that he has to offer, plus everything else, why should we not be assured that it is well with our soul at the present time and shall remain so until the day of Jesus Christ? You know that I, we might not get to it this week, but when we finish our studies for the year next week, Lord willing, in this lesson, we're going to have to ask ourselves some serious questions, you know. Because it, our depravity is so great that even after we are saved and have the evidence of God's love for us, we still doubt. What, I, I told you that Paul is going to explore some avenues. First, the first point, the first road he goes down is sin. Can sin separate us from the love of Christ? Folks, we're going to try to deal with all the tough issues. We're not going to hide away from any. Because there are persons who when... We finish where Paul says, I am persuaded that such and such and such and such. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. People say, what you see, he didn't mention sin. But there's a reason why he didn't mention sin there, because he dealt with it up here. He didn't have to mention sin there, because he already dealt with it early here. Verses 33 and 34, his answer is decisive. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justified. Who is he that condemned it? It is Christ that died. Yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God who also maketh intercession for us? Listen, brothers and sisters, I, when I say this, I'm saying it in the fear of God. Sin cannot affect the security of our position in Christ because God has justified us. I'm not saying that we won't sin, you know. And I'm not saying that there are not consequences for sin. I am saying it cannot affect the security of our position in Christ. God has justified us. I've been struggling to try to get us to understand what this means. God has declared us righteous in Christ. Satan would like to accuse us, and he does accuse us, and he has sufficient evidence to do so. But we stand righteous in Jesus Christ. There is nobody in this room that Satan has to tell any lie on. Satan don't have to tell no lie on me. He just have to show God what I have done, what I am thinking, what I have said. Well, he can't show God what I'm thinking because he doesn't know, but God knows anyway. But he can He just says, this is, hear what he said? Yeah, yeah. Look at what he did. But, but and, and, and it's true. And remember last time we met with, looked at this high priest Zachariah who was standing before the Lord in filthy garments and Satan was standing at his right hand to accuse him and we would have said well all right this is a powerful court scene now so now what it means is that God will have to hear the accusation and all the, the evidence comes in None of that. The Lord just said, take off the filthy garments. Put on new garments. 
Put a mitre on his head. Go back and do the high priest work. It, up till now, he has not even addressed Satan. It's like Satan wasn't there. I'm not concerned with you. Justification. Go back and do the work. I have cleansed your iniquity. Go on back and do the work. So we think now it's hell and powder house up in heaven when Satan start accuse us and God don't know what to say. Can the evidence is there? The man garment was filthy. You have to understand what it means when we say we stand righteous in Jesus Christ. We are God's elect. Remember that, brethren. We are chosen in Christ. We are accepted in Christ. God will not accuse us because he's the one who justifies us. If he turned around to accuse us, it would mean that he was a failure in salvation. He would be admitting that I made a mistake. I saved this one and I realized that I'm not going to be able to take her or him all the way. Are you crazy? The one who declares you not guilty now turns around and says you are guilty. Come on. Don't let the devil mess with you like that. Don't allow that to happen to you. Understand what justification is. Understanding the meaning of justification brings peace to our hearts. When God declares the believing sinner righteous in Christ, that declaration never changes. He is acquitted. He is acquitted because of what Jesus Christ has done. G Don't forget, brethren, that Jesus Christ made an atonement for us. His atonement means that his sacrifice, his death was of such a nature that it satisfied God. So, if your security is challenged, it means that God has become unsatisfied with what Christ has done. That's how powerful the thing is. Our experience as Christians change. It, it suffers change from day to day. But justification never changes. Satan will accuse us. Men may accuse us, and we may even accuse ourselves. But God will never take us to court and accuse us because Jesus has already paid the penalty and we are secure in him. The judge of judges has already dealt with all the charges against us in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The thing is settled. That's what justification is. How, have you ever heard of Joan of Arc? Anybody here has heard of Joan of Arc? Joan of Arc, actually, well, her name tells you that is a lady. And she fought some battles and, and she believed she was fighting for the Lord. She actually believed God gave her a vision. And when she was to be executed, burnt as a heretic, Joan of, one of the charges brought against her is that she, she said she's, she, well, she's assured that she's going to heaven. And the church said, Nobody can be sure that they are going to heaven. That is heresy. You cannot know if you are going to heaven until you die. And John says in his first epistle, These things write I unto you that you may know that you have eternal life. Paul says being confident of this very thing. So many of us, let me say this, brethren, and I'm saying it, I'm trying to be very careful. It's the persons who criticize the Roman Catholics, 
and denounce them and say that they are not part of that system. If they preach that you cannot have assurance of salvation, they are totally Catholic, Roman Catholic in their thinking. It is only a person who has been saved by grace and understands it that can have assurance. Persons who understand justification. If you believe that you cannot have any assurance, it is because you still don't understand justification. But we're not going to leave it, you know. We're going to teach it until we die. We're going to teach it until we die. Because what we said on Sunday is that we have to continue to preach and teach the gospel, which is not Acts 2.38. But I, sure, I want to show you something in Isaiah chapter 50, verses 5 to 11. Amazing thing. What we have here is Isaiah in, in the latter part of his, his prophecy. He gives us several pictures of Jesus Christ as the suffering servant of Yahweh. And this is one of them. It's a prophecy about Jesus. The sovereign Lord has spoken to me and I have listened. I have not rebelled or turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me and my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mockery and spitting. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a stone, determined to do his will. And I know that I will not be put to shame. He, I think Paul was reading this when he wrote Romans chapter 8. He who gives me justice is near. Remember Paul said, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who will dare to bring charges against me now? Where are my accusers? Let them appear. See, the sovereign Lord is, if God be for us, sovereign Lord is on my side. Who will declare me guilty? All my enemies will be destroyed like old clothes that have been eaten by moths. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys his servant? If you are walking in darkness without a ray of light, trust in the Lord and rely on your God. But watch out, you who live in your own light and warm yourselves by your own fires. This is the reward you will receive from me. You will soon fall down in great torment. Here we have a portrait of Jesus Christ, the suffering servant of Yahweh. In verses 7 to 10, we see him confidently expecting to be vindicated by God from the false accusations that have been made against him. He expects confidently that he will not be put to shame. He expects that God is going to set him free and, and, and show everybody that everything you were saying about me was false. Because we are in Christ. Our union with him is so intimate and so unbreakable, we can be assured that his righteousness with which we are clothed will secure our acquittal also. We are in him so we can be just as confident as him. He who gives me justice is near. Who will dare to bring charges against me? The sovereign Lord is on my side. Who will declare me guilty? Jesus said that and I am in him. I can talk like him. That's why Paul borrows his words. And that is why Paul says, there is therefore now. Listen, 
This is, we didn't deal with this. Therefore, now, now, that's important. Now, there is not even one bit of condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, right now, there is therefore now no condemnation. Right now. We're not talking about in the future when everything's done. Right now. If you're living in condemnation, it's because you still don't understand the God that you are serving. You cannot. Right now, there is no condemnation if you are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation now, none in the future. But you see what verse 11 says? Those who trust in their own righteousness, who live in their own light, they are going to fall down in great torment. Say, all who believe that it is their faithfulness and their years of serving God and the several ministries that they have been involved in and their tithing record is so good and they fast and pray. They are trusting in their own righteousness. The Lord says they will fall down in great torment. But the saints are aware that they have no righteousness of their own. So their only hope is to trust in the Lord and rely on their God. Saints never say, Lord, I am guiltless in and of myself. That's a Lord. That's why the songwriter said, my faith looks up to thee. Thou Lamb of Calvary, my faith looks up to thee. I would never try to justify myself. There is one who will plead for me. There can be no condemnation for us because the same Savior who died for us is now interceding for us in heaven. But not, you, you never read, read these things before. Eh? He's at the right hand of God. The position of honor and power, executive power. As our high priest, he gives us the grace we need to overcome temptation and defeat the enemy. Hebrews chapter 4, 14 to 16 says that. As our advocate, he forgives our sins and restores our fellowship with God. Intercession means that Jesus Christ represents us before the throne of God and we do not have to represent ourselves. Brethren, if the one who died for you is the one who is pleading for you in heaven, how are you going? You're not understanding. You're not understanding. What, 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 do you think, what do you think his intercessory prayer is? His intercessory prayer is, I died for her. Is me die for her that praying for her. And I want to ask a question. Is there a prayer that Jesus can pray for you that will not be answered? I don't have to represent myself in heaven. There's one. I have an advocate with the Father. I don't want to get you into any trouble, you know, but Jesus Christ, not pleading to himself. We have an advocate with the Father, Lord of mercy. We're not going to deal with that tonight. Sin can't separate us from the love of God. It can't. It can't. He bridged that gap long time ago on Calvary. So 
So now he's going to, he's going to explore a multitude of other points of departure from the security of our position in Christ. And he, he's going to conclude by showing the finality of our hope of glory. Let's look at Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, our distress, our persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, Holy Ghost said no. No, not only is it that these things can't separate us from the love of God, not only that they can't separate us, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not through our fasting and prayer, do you know? Through him that, see the permanence of the love, is the love is taking us through all these things. Through him that loved us, we are more than conquerors. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. When Paul asks, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What is he referring to when he refers to the love of Christ? Is he referring to our love for Christ? Or to Christ's love for us? Well, the context clearly indicates that he's referring to the love of Christ for the saints. Paul has already stated that God is for us. He has said that we have the proof of it because God gave his only begotten son for us. He delivered him up for us all. He didn't spare him. He, he has told us in the verses that we just read that no one is going to be able successfully to lay anything to the charge of God's elect or to condemn them. And now he stresses the permanence of the love of Christ under all adverse circumstances. He argues that no circumstance can affect Christ's love for his elect. Indeed, it is because of his love for us that we are victorious over all such adversities because he loves us. And then he ends by expressing his persuasion that no created thing shall ever separate us from the love of God. But this that I'm going to say now is very important and we need God's help because if we don't get God's help, we're going to struggle. Listen to me now. One of the great tests, and I said it at a funeral yesterday, I think I said it. One of the great tests of our spiritual health is what we think about the love of Christ as it relates to us. When, when, if you are here, listen to me now. Hear me now, brethren, this is serious. If you are sitting here, you watching on live stream, or, and, and you are not persuaded that God loves you with a strong and permanent love, you are not in a position of spiritual health. I don't care how much you speak in tongues. 
And if you are not a person who speaks in tongues a lot, but you are persuaded that God loves you with an intimate and permanent love, you are in good health. It's as simple as that. If you are not persuaded that God loves you, you cannot be in good health. Because the only, the only thing that can assure us of anything in the future or of now is the love of God for us. And, and I understand that there are many factors that militate against persons accepting the love of God for themselves. And Paul knew that. If, if, if you were not properly fathered, it's going to be difficult for you to think of a loving father. Here's what Paul says. In Ephesians 3, 14 to 19, he says, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. What do I pray for? I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower power you with inner strength through his spirit then he's talking to people who are already saved you know then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him your roots will grow down into what into God's love that's where your roots must be anchored not in your righteousness into God's love and keep you strong and may you this is a part of his prayer may you have the power to understand as all God's people should how wide how long how high and how deep his love is may you experience Experience the love of Christ, though it is too great to understand fully. Then, then, when you understand the love of Christ, then will you be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Paul says, I want you to understand with all of God's people how wide, how wide, how wide you can't wander so far away that that love can't reach you and pull you in. How wide. The saints need to understand that because we are weak and prone to wander. How long No matter how far you run, how high, how deep you can't sing too low. A little chorus. I don't know if anybody knows it. I'm sorry I can't sing. It says, reach up for him. He's reaching down for you. You can never sing too low. Don't you think God knows what you're going through? The miles of space his amazing grace will span. Brethren, this is critical. And you see, a lot of the time I spend in prayer is praying that I and all of you will understand the love of God. I'm not sure that we have ever been taught how important this is. This is not obeying Acts 2.38. You can do that and never know how much God loves you. But understanding this is part of the gospel. So, so we have to pray for each other. I have to pray for you and, and for myself that all of us 
I was going to say, all of the arms house that happened to us. I was going to say it. The, the things that happened to us that caused us not to be able to deal with this easily. You see, if you have been nurtured in a loving home, it's easier for you to understand it, you know. The wonderful thing about it is, though, that God understands that as well. So he knows that some of us have a greater handicap. So, but, but this is, when we pray, we have, to, we have to ask God, help me to understand how much you love me. So I believe that's why people have a problem with justification. Because it, it, to think that God has declared me righteous, and you know within yourself that you in and of yourself are not holy, you are not righteous. It's like what we talked about on Sunday, the prostitute who became the queen. She's the queen, but all she knows is how to act as a prostitute. She don't have the training, she don't have the etiquette, she don't have the manners, she can't speak like a queen, but the king is married to her. So she's the queen, and it's probably going to take her years to even begin to even start thinking like a queen. But nobody can challenge her status. She's the queen. It won't take us years to live the way God wants us to live. But nobody can challenge our status. We are children of God. So it go. Don't understand how to operate. Make a lot of mistakes. Because the whole of our past come with us. And everything that we learn. We have to unlearn. A lot of what we have learned, we have to unlearn, you know. And even some of our training and what we get degrees in help to mash us up to. Beloved ones, the love of Christ is eternal. It is eternal, for it is that love which constrained him to leave heaven's throne and come down to this earth to redeem us. It was love that brought him down. Philippians 2, 5 to 8. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. The love of Christ for us is deep for it is that love which urged him to press on to the end of the road as he humbled himself to the death, even the death of the cross. It was that love which when he saw up front and close <clears throat> just what it meant to drink the cup and he turned away and said, is this, if, if it, is there another way that you can find Father? It was love that made him say, I'll drink it. Amen. The love of Christ for us is broad. For it is that love which opened the arms of God to sinners and made it possible for the very ones who nailed him to the cross to be forgiven. Love of Christ is unchanging, for it is that love which comes to us today, right now, in the midst of our need, 
whatever that need may be, need for mercy, need for grace, need for strength, whatever, and takes us out of darkness into light and from doubt to uncertainty and from death to life. So we're coming now to what I was talking about. In Romans 8, 35 to 39, Paul presents the love of God for us in the face of its permanence. He spoke about the love of Christ for us from we started in verse 28. All things work together for good. But he is kind of zeroing on the permanence of love. It is as if in this passage God stoops down to tell us that the love of Christ is not fickle, it's not changing. He left the splendor of heaven and came down to earth. He allowed himself to be led to Pilate's judgment hall, where he was buffeted and spat upon. He submitted himself to the cruelty of scourging. He walked to Calvary and permitted men to nail him to the cross. From that cross, he cried out in love, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Here's, here's the point I want to make, brethren. We read of these things in his word. And that very word tells us that all these things happen for our salvation. We know that he did this for us. And then we look upon him with amazement and dare to question whether or not he really loves us. This is my, this is my problem. This is my problem. The word tells us that he did this for us. The word tells us that you know, Paul says, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So how could we ever doubt that he loves us? What more does he need to do to prove to us that he loves us? Here in this passage, he tells us that nothing can separate us from his love. Will we believe the voice of our shepherd or will we believe the voice of a stranger? Our Lord says the voice of a stranger, they will not follow. So when the stranger tells us that God doesn't really love you, you have sinned too much, no more grace for you, Whose voice are we going to listen to? Are we going to listen to the voice of a stranger that says to us the love of God is not sufficient to secure us until that great day? And the question we ask is, what depths of sin and depravity yet remains in our hearts? when we who have heard of and experienced the love of Christ can still doubt its reality and permanence. You know how many times we break the heart of Jesus? All of these, the epistles, are love letters straight from his heart. And we, in the face of all of that, will still doubt whether he loves us. It tells us that <clears throat> our psychological problem is great. Something wrong with us psychologically. In the face of all evidence, that he loves us and will secure us. We have doubts. So that's why I'm telling us, brethren, that we, if, if God was relying on us to make it, it would be, it, it, 
he wouldn't be so foolish. And if you had sense and if I had sense, we would know we can't make it. At the funeral service yesterday, I was saying to the folks, there are persons who say, I don't want to become a Christian because I don't know if I can live the life. So I said to them, you know, have to wonder. I can tell you, sir, you can't live the life. You cannot live it. And I told them, I was honest with them. I said, I used to think I could live it, but I stopped doing that now. I met the one who can live it, live it through me. I tell them, you, you can't live it. Somebody have to live it through you. What, what, will we ever really believe that God loves us with a permanent love and he loves us through our mess, in our mess? This is why Acts 2.38 alone can't help us. When you, brethren, let me say this. You see, when you take a truth and make it, it make it into the truth you get into serious problems don't do that don't take a truth and think that it is the truth it is a truth it is not the truth I feel like I want to stop here tonight. Let's stand. Love, wonderful love, the love of Christ. Wide, Touch yourself, touch yourself. For me, for me, to me. So rich. So free. Why does he? One more time, love. love
Lift your hands and just worship. Brothers and sisters, I want us to take a minute and just pray and ask the Lord to help us to believe it. Just ask God in your own way. Just take a minute and say, Lord, help me to believe it. Help me to be persuaded like Paul. Brethren, there are some things, some things you can't shout, shout your way to them. No, I'm trying to get us out of this mode that if you say Jesus seven times loud, it will happen. And if you say hallelujah five times or seven times, and the last time we're going to go deep down for it, that's not going to help you. That only give you vibes, you know, psych you up. It's not no lasting value. It's good in service because it brings down excitement. But it now have no lasting value. And you know it too. Let us call our king by his name. Our king already knew his name. We need to start believing the gospel. That's what we need. We need to understand. Hear me folks. You see, when I am dealing with my frailty, when I'm dealing with my weaknesses, when I'm dealing with my failures, I need to believe that I have a cushion. That while I am faced with it, that, 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 that there is a love of God that won't let me go in the midst of it. And while he's working on me and while I'm stumbling and fumbling all over the place, there's a cushion of his love. You can't shout your way to that. Tongues not going to help you with that. Hallelujah and all them things don't work. You have to believe the gospel. That's why you have so many of us all over the world that speak in tongues a lot and messed up. We need to understand that in the midst of my marital failure, there is a God who loves me. You understand? My divorce is not what defines me with God. You understand what I'm saying, folks? Lord Jesus. Paul says I, to the Ephesians, I'm praying that one day you will understand it. Because that's when you're going to start seeing victory. When you understand how much God loves you. And that nothing can separate you from his love. Not even sin. See, when we sing all these songs, no sin can enter there. And if at the judgment bar sinful spots your soul can mar, you will never enter there. And you do even like sing the song. If you understood the gospel, you could sing it without a problem. 
because you understand that you are closing the righteousness of Christ. So sinful spot can't mar you there. Because you have no sinful spots to show. Because everything is covered under the blood. It's not that you perfect yourself to the point where you stop sin. If that is what you're waiting for, none of us will make it in the rapture. It will be rupture. We're going to make it because we are clothed in his righteousness. Praise God. Praise God. Lord Jesus, we are in your presence. Foolish, brutish, many times without understanding. Lord God, some of us are laboring under serious mental and emotional handicaps because of the experiences that we have had since childhood. And it is so difficult for us to accept and to believe that anyone could ever love us the way your word says you love us. And when we believe that we have prayed through, and when we believe that we have done well, we can somehow embrace the fact that you love us. But when we have failed, when we have stumbled, it's difficult for us because experience has taught us that love only works when things are going well but help us lord help all of us to somehow come to understand what is the height and depth and length and breadth and to know the love of God which passeth knowledge. So that then we can come into the fullness of the salvation that we say we have. That we say we have received. We are tired, Lord, of fear and doubt. We are tired of being buffeted by suggestions from the voice of the stranger that you really don't love us. Deliver us from true false doctrine. Help us to see that you really love us. Deliver us from a works-based religion. Deliver us from a salvation that is procured by us in partnership with you. Open our understanding to the majesty of the salvation that we enjoy. And Lord, for those of us who have spoken in tongues at an altar and been baptized in your name, but have never really been exposed to your love, have never really heard the full declaration of the gospel. Help us, Lord. Rescue us. Deliver us. Oh, God, forward your agenda for us so that we can really be witnesses of you, credible witnesses, so that when we tell people about you, we can tell them about you with confidence, because we know in whom we have believed. The offering that we will receive tonight, Lord, please bless it and multiply it for the use of your great kingdom and help us as your people lord as we go ashore our hearts and help us to see that it is in you 
that we find everything that we need. So we entrust ourselves into your keeping and your care. And we give you thanks in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen and amen. Um, brethren,